Hey folks, welcome to the podcast. Today I had a great chat with Josh Breckenfeld. He works for Lloyds of London and uh, used to be in Washington, worked for Barack Obama and then decided to come to the UK, uh, change career and um, yeah, really interesting to hear about his story. Uh, we talk about being authentic in the workplace, the importance of, uh, of being visible and I yeah, really hope you enjoy it. Hey, it's Lewis. Welcome to the podcast. Enjoy our conversations anytime, anywhere. Cool. And we're live. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry I didn't have you on before, uh, Leon. That, that's all right. I, mean, I was a bit embarrassed. But my feelings were only slightly hurt. <laughs> but, you know, I understand he's a little bit older than I am. So you want to get him <laughs> while he's still young. Exactly, uh, exactly. And you're much better looking, so... I think he would agree with that. Definitely. So, uh, so we've met, what, we met probably six months ago? Yeah. A year ago? Yeah. It's not been long. It hasn't. Um, but it's been really good. I wanted to get you on. You've got a great story. Yeah, well, thank and you. you're doing a lot of great stuff. And thank I'm a you. big fan. Thanks, man. That's right. Um, so how did you end up in the UK? Well, that was totally uh, by coincidence, actually. So uh, my husband and I were based in Washington, D.C., and we had both lived there for about 10 years. And um, at the time, I was working in the United States Senate. Nice, uh, I was the, nice. Yeah, it was, it was, I've got, I've got cracking stories I on bet. that. And president, under Obama. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it was under Obama. And then, um, in fact, I helped organize his first inauguration. I was a member of the oh, joint, inaugural, cool. uh, joint Inaugural Congressional Ceremony, something like that, JCCIC, nice, nice. Um, that sort of put together his first inauguration. Um, and so I was doing that, and I was going to law school at night, uh, because I was looking for an efficient way to alienate my friends and going to law school at night seemed like the right way to do it. Oh, so you were doing, so you were both, you were doing that and you were... Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. Busy was, boy. I was a very busy boy. Um, and then we sort of got to this place where we're like, okay, it's been 10 years. You know, what do we do now? Yeah. And um, we sort of had the conversation, Andrew and I had the conversation about we should be open to whatever the next opportunity is. Yeah, yeah. And literally it was about a week after we had that conversation Andrew got a call from his old boss saying uh -huh. that uh Andrew's a banker saying that he had started this bank uh and yeah. that he wanted he was wondering if Andrew would come and run the retail operation for it nice. so that was in October right. and we were living here full-time by January wow so and, this, a, and this was which year so this was five years ago Five years ago. Okay. Yeah. So it was a really, really quick turnaround. And for Andrew, it was great. He walked into this fantastic job. Great. Um, you know, we started getting ourselves together really quickly. For me, it was a little bit more difficult. Um, How did you feel about upping sticks? And in principle, I didn't have an issue. And in fact, I was really, really excited about it. I had studied in Scotland when I was in university for a time. And I, I loved the idea of moving over here. And um, it was a really exciting prospect. But on the flip side of that, uh, career-wise... Uh, it was pretty, I mean, it was, it was pretty much a cut, right? Because yeah, yeah, everything yeah. I had been doing up until that point was looking for a public policy job and furthering my so career. So we to carry on in politics. Yeah, in politics and uh, in the Senate. And, and maybe uh, work for Donald Trump at some point. I mean, who could ask for anything more? <laughs> um, but, but that wasn't going to happen here. And so uh, when I got to London, it was a bit of a, actually it was- So did you come here with no idea about- No idea nothing? and no job. Wow. So the first obstacle was, uh, when we moved here, it was actually one semester away from graduating law school. <laughs> yeah, so then the question is, <clears throat> do I stay behind in D.C., go to school yeah. while Andrew's in London? That seems like a terrible option. So I was going to Catholic law school uh, because I wanted to be a morally uh, infused lawyer. A Catholic law school? Catholic law school, right. and I am not Catholic. Um, <laughs> But I didn't know how they, they have religious uh, law schools there. Well, it, it's not necessarily religious. They had a couple classes that you would take sort of about morality and the law. Right. And right, right, right. Uh, they also had a really good uh, public policy program as well because uh, okay. they realized that um, people were going to law school not necessarily with the intention of becoming lawyers. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. so all that really lined up nicely for me. But what didn't line up nicely is they don't have a campus in London. And um, so it was a real... It was a bit of a struggle. So I ended, what I ended up doing was, um, and this is a neat trick. Um, so Notre Dame is another law school in right. the United States, and they're also affiliated with the Catholic Church. Uh, right. So I went to my dean and said, I need to be able to 
figure this out. Can you help me out? And she said, well, why don't you write me? She said, we don't allow transfers in right. senior years unless it's the breaking of the marital home. And oh, I right. said, well, I am a member of a marital home. <laughs> However, my, my, you know, I'm married yeah. to a, a man. And she said, okay, this is what we're going to do. Just write me a letter and make it so you're being factually correct, but you don't need to speak about a gender at all. And right. just, you know, and I will know, and that works. And so she granted my transfer on that basis. I applied to Notre Dame, got in, transferred there, London Law Campus. Perfect. And my final semester was pass fail. So it was, it was, oh, wow. it was dreamy, but no job prospect after that. So an American law. Yeah, because I was an American lawyer and then everyone was sort of like, oh, you could just convert. And it's, it's actually not that easy to get, uh, to convert to a solicitor's or even a barrister's it requires more study and more yeah, testing. Yeah. And at that point, you know, I'd been in law school for four years and just taking the bar exam. I was kind of done with, with studying for a while. So I can't remember what the connection was. I think there was somebody in my, you no, know, there was an alumni from Notre Dame who knew somebody that worked in this law firm. And it was, it was literally a Hail Mary pass. So <laughs> I went and worked with them for a time helping them draft a US UK tax law treatise. Wow. Which is about as interesting as it <laughs> sounds. And for someone that never took tax law, like didn't appreciate it, like it at all, uh, it was it was awful, but it was awful in a way that allowed me to motivate myself to get out there and do yeah, something else. Definitely. Yeah. And you had um, you got a European passport? Not yet. So we're residents of the UK. So you got. So your husband got a visa. Yeah. So this and you're able to. That's right. So Andrew's visa, uh, and this was also interesting because a lot of this seems to be hinging on the fact that I'm married. But um, Andrew got a visa, and because I was his spouse, I was entitled to a spousal visa. Perfect. And that was all happening before uh, gay marriage was legal in the UK. So what was interesting oh, right. was that the UK recognized a right in us that they had yet to afford. Interesting, and this was in 2005? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right, yeah, it was about that time. So, um, so anyway, I was, I was working at this law firm, writing this book and hating every minute of it, and um, I was speaking to about half a dozen recruiters, to be fair, yeah, because yeah. I was trying to figure out a way that my public policy background would give me an entrance into some industry. Uh, and I wasn't particularly focused about it. And I thought that was probably the right thing to do because I thought if I'd, if I'd focused too hard, I would have been unsatisfied for a long time. Yeah. And actually the recruiter that picked up the phone first uh, was one that was working in the communications. And I had done some press work uh, yeah. very lightly on the Hill. You know, I'd written uh, testimony for senators and staff and stuff like that. So I had a bit of press background. And there was a job opening at Lloyd's of London, um, which was a strategy slash comms role, but it was also very low level. I mean, it was basically first rung of the ladder. And you, had you ever heard of Lloyd's of London? Um, I had heard of it, but I'd be lying if I said I knew what it was at the point of contact. Right. So when they said Lloyd's, you thought Lloyd's Bank? Um, no, I knew it wasn't a bank, but I didn't know what it was, yeah, to yeah. be fair. And I, th I thought it was an insurance company and it's not. Uh, it's neither of those things. Um, yeah. So the first thing that I did was spend a lot of time reading about it uh, before the interview. I was super nervous. Yeah, of course. Um, and it's funny because, you know, and my recruiter and I were talking about this. Apparently it was a really big deal that I was moving into a new sector, you know, at this stage in my career. I mean, I'm not as old as Leon, but, <laughs> um, but I'm also not in my early 20s either. So I remember like every interview I went to, we spent half of the interview talking about why, why I wanted to pursue this job, why I wanted to leave. It's, 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 it's hard to move sectors. Completely. And I was unprepared for that. I was completely unprepared for that conversation and yeah. the veracity with which people would judge my character and my CV based on the fact that I was leaving an industry. Because also you think, why are you leaving? You're not doing well. Yeah, exactly. You're there's a bit a older, skepticism. there's a bit there's of a skepticism. skepticism, yeah. And then it plays forward, like, are you gonna do that to us? Like, if we invest yeah. time and energy in hiring you in this very low level job, are you gonna up sticks and leave? Actually, quickly? if something better comes along, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, so I had to spend a lot of time convincing people that, uh, that I do have staying power. You know, I worked for almost nine years on the Hill. So, you know, I, and I could have and left there, And was there no desire to like switch to UK politics? No, no, because it wasn't, um, to be fair, my time when I left the Hill, I was really ready to go just about cold turkey. Right. Um, okay. is, in terms of uh, not following it, not doing anything. And when I got over here, it's not, 
it's not as similar as some people uh, would make it out. And it, you know, it would have required a lot more of retrenching. And I just, I wasn't, my heart just wasn't in it. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, I know that sounds cheesy, but it just wasn't in it. It's nice to have a change. Yeah. And and I thought, you know, it's good to pivot. We're starting a new life here. Yeah. Let's let's give it a solid go. Yeah. yeah. But um. But yeah, it, it certainly wasn't easy. So it was the hardest thing actually convincing people. Yeah, I think so. That I genuinely want a new career. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And that, and that my skill set. And this is the other interesting thing. I, um, I had to have a lot of conversations with people about. Well, no, I've not technically done that technical thing, but I have a skill set that'll will let me rise to that. Yeah. And so you know, yes, I will have to read up on insurance and get get to terms with the industry and you know learn some subject matter expertise but the general skills that you need to do this job I have them yeah um, just applied in a completely different field it's interesting because it's actually probably harder to convince it's almost maybe harder for the interviewer to take a shot on you mm. than it would be for you to transition into these roles yeah because it's, it's quite rare that people give someone a chance yeah I and I mean and I and I reckon I mean I give I give full credit uh, for them taking the chance on me uh, because and then there was also this conversation of, well, this is a really low level job. You've had higher up jobs. Are you just going to sit in this for six months and leave? And what I told them and I and I meant it. And I think, you know, five years later, I'm still with Lloyd's. I think it's a testament to the fact that when I apply myself to something, I want to learn as much as I can. Yeah. You know, I want to exhibit curiosity and I want to um, I want to be rewarded by being promoted up yeah. when I yeah. receive the, you know, the skill set that's necessary to do that yeah. um and they they believe me <laughs> great well you're obviously very competent in your job so yeah. you did well and you've been you. uh, have, you, have you found that um working in the uk or well, london specifically i guess has been a big transition yes and that was i mean we were I, I think i was very naive in how easy it would be to come over here and work you know um both in terms of how the workplace is structured, a workplace, yeah. ESO, workplace ethos, um, all of that is completely different. Um, there's a work-life balance, which is very different here than what I was used to. Um, so in, in America, you know, it's, it's always been my experience and everyone has their own experiences, but it's always been my experience that the individual is really encouraged to achieve, achieve well, you know, go through goals, really smash targets, yeah, you yeah. know, yeah. lead in that way. And what I found working here is that it is a much more team effort, right? So, and, and, and I use the word effort because oftentimes people are rewarded based solely on the effort they put to a project, whether yes, yeah. or not that project actually succeeds is almost a secondary point. Yeah. Whereas in the States, it's all about the result. However, you need to get there, get there. Yeah. And here, you know, it's, it's about talking to stakeholders and making sure that the team feels comfortable with what we're doing and adjusting our strategy appropriately to ultimately reach the goal. And I don't think, you know, there are definitely benefits to both and there are definitely detriments to both. There's yeah, points yeah. of frustration with each, but I was blithely unaware. Wow. I, it's that. interesting. I was, over here. I, I love, I love, um, cause I think you look at America and the way Americans work and they're very positive, they're happy to chat, you know, um, public speaking is often really good. Yeah. In the UK, it's a little bit embarrassing to promote yourself. People mm. tend not to do it. Mm. Um, the team thing's interesting because again, you look at America and you feel like it's all a uh, yeah, you know, USA. That yeah. Just, <laughs> whereas here, it's not like that. No. So it's, it's really interesting. I think we could we could do here. We could do a lot with. Uh, yeah, and to be fair, both both countries could could take a little bit yeah, of the yeah, other's model. True. True. Um, yeah, I mean, I remember when I first came here and I I did um, a Myers Briggs test, which oh, yeah. is first. And by the way, I've done one just about every single year that I've been here <laughs> because you know. Yeah. some sort of strategy group always wants to know. And I remember speaking to the guy afterwards and just being very candid about strengths and weaknesses. And it was the first time that I was really aware that as an American, I am trained to, you know, be louder, like yeah. vocally louder. And, yeah. you know, and that I really needed to temper that. And so... Don't temper it too much, though. No, and, and, and I try not to. I, I, I try to temper it in the way that it becomes more... Oh, wow. That's some serious that thunder. some serious thunder, yeah. Um, I try to temper it in a way that makes me more receptive to be heard by a larger group of people yeah, yeah. without losing my authenticity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I accept that you make adjustments, um, and you should. You, you should be refining yourself as you go through a work career. And that's one of the ones that I've always tried to 
tried to focus on. I don't know. You probably speak to the people around me. It's like no, he's he's just well, as loud as he Well, I always. mean, it's great, and you obviously done well because you were recognised in the in the FT and outstanding yeah. top fifty, unbelievable future leaders for LGBT. Unbelievable. It's great. Um, in only five years being here. It, yeah, in only five years being here, and it was it was great. Um, but I, it was also really scary for me. Um, and I tell people this fairly openly. Uh, you know, I in my job now, I look after. 10 companies that operate in the market um, from their business perspective, uh, making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing and making sure that Lloyd's is being clear with our messages and all that sort of stuff. So it, it requires a lot of communication. Yeah. Um, and most of that is with the C-suites of these companies and with Lloyd's. And, you know, I was sort of looking at myself before this FT list came out and just realizing I'm probably only out like uh, to seven of those. Oh, right. You know, where I talk about my husband, and, yeah, you know, just yeah. as you and I are talking. Yeah, yeah. And then the others, I don't do that. Um, I always keep well, it just very because vague. you haven't got into that personal. Be yeah. And be well, because I just haven't gotten something from them right, yeah. that tells me it's safe to right, okay. be myself. And so okay. this FT list was a bit of a scary thing because I was like, well, if any of these people read the Financial Times, they're going to know, <laughs> you know, and, and, in, and in, in hindsight, I was really... But you, you, asked, you gave your permission to be included, Absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Because um, it's absolutely the right thing yeah, to yeah, do. Yeah, um, yeah, It's the right thing to do for me, but it's also the right thing to do for anybody that is reading that list and looking for visible role models in this industry. Absolutely. Um, I feel very strongly about that. I mean, we, I mean, we at Lloyd's, we've really tried to, to make great strides in being visible, but, you know, we did a survey in 2017 that said half of our employees who are out still don't feel comfortable being fully out at work. And that was, that was something that really resonated with me that says as much as we're doing, we still have to do more to make people. Yeah. But is that because the environment isn't like friendly or just it's your own personal? It's, I mean, for me, it's a combination of the two, right? Like either the, the environment is very neutral and I just can't pick up a, 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 I can't pick up a positive cue. So I was speaking about this the other day with somebody. I think most people, when you ask them, you know, you take them for a cup of coffee or whatever, and they'll say, um, you know, I've just got to be honest with you. I think everybody should be themselves. It doesn't matter to me. I'm very, you know, I, I, I just don't even consider it, which is great, yeah. right? Because as a starting point, it, it's a great thing. But my challenge back was, well, how would I know that about you if other than me sitting down and having a cup of coffee with you. Like, yeah, what it's also something you can see. Yeah. Yes. Like, what are you doing or what are you saying? Yeah. Or what are you not saying when you're interacting with people um, to give them that visual cue? Because I fully admit, you know, for those three businesses that I'm not particularly out to, it's in my head. It's not because I've heard something terrible at their water cooler. Yeah. They've got bunting up that says no gays allowed. I mean, this <laughs> is this is totally a construct that is in my head, but it's based on past experiences yeah. where being out and being presented to somebody who wasn't particularly happy about that uh, is a very uncomfortable thing. Yeah, um, yeah. And so I, you know, I, I live my life not to replicate those moments. <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's great. It's great. It's yeah. great. So, um, so it was a big moment then. To it was it. such, yeah, it was such a big moment. And I didn't, I didn't fully appreciate it because work was just going nuts and all and everything. And then. Just, How does it work? So someone said, I want to fit yeah, forward. Yeah. So, um, so I was nominated uh, by two people, actually. One of my coworkers, Jane Adams, uh, who's amazing, and then the other one is my boss, John Hancock. Uh, oh, awesome. So, awesome. and they, I don't, I don't know if they conspired together or if they did it independently. Awesome. Oh, okay. But, uh, but yeah, both of them put me forward. Um, amazing. And then I found out actually when we were in Mexico a few weeks ago before the list came out that that I won it, or that I'd what? been named on it. Shocking. It's a little tequila. Yeah. And then you know you read. Like you really read the um, the biographies of what people are accomplishing in this space, and it is, it is such an empowerful, powerful list. And then we went to the the gala dinner, and you know they've got several lists. Mine's like yeah. the young person because I'm young. Um, so and on the I don't I don't think they have an age. It was just future leaders, Fine. which is good. Suki was smart in that way. Uh, but they also had like CEO and uh, a CEO list, and they also were C suite list, and then they have a top allies list, and then they had uh, I think public sector list. And each of the four who were top on each of those lists spoke at this event. And like, I was absolutely gobsmacked with each of them. You know, yes. like yeah. it was just the stories and how people are articulating, how they're moving these fields um, and really pushing the envelope was incredible. And I, I just, 
It was one of the, you know, sometimes it's you quite, go... These, but the, yeah, you do. They're, they're not good chats, are they? But, yeah. But when it's about your personal experience... And, and you open up and they can be really powerful. about it. Yeah, oh, yeah. it was amazing. It was yeah. absolutely amazing. I mean, yeah. anyone who hasn't looked at these lists or looked at the people who's on the top of them, just do it. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying look at mine. Go to the, go to the top. These people are yeah. outrageous. Uh, and are they, are they motivate you to, to kind of put yourself out there and be a role model? And yeah. I mean, I think, and... I think it's, it shifted something in me um, because essentially what I was lacking before in courage, I just need to fake and do it. Yeah, you know, yeah, I just yeah, need to do it and, and be aware that uh, that will both work for me and in some instances work against me. But but it's important, certainly if I'm interested in taking more of a leadership role in an organization, I think authenticity, personal authenticity is so important. Yes. Yeah. Um, and there's no there's no point in me presenting a professional person and then me being somebody else. Yeah. Uh, as soon as I'm off the clock, I think. But can you be authentic and not? share everything about your life i think that's fair uh i think you can but there there is this i don't know i don't really know how to describe it other than to describe it as like the malaise of professionalism yes. and i see this across all like uh, many different people not just gay people i mean straight people have this issue too where you meet them and you have a conversation and they're this wonderful engaging person or they have this really great personality and then you exchange emails or phone and you're like, it's a, like a completely different person. You know, it's like the dear sir or madam email. And I was like, oh. but I just, just met you. <laughs> and, and you know, that but level. It, but it's funny though, business, when you meet people in a business context, yeah. um, taking it from business to personal, and maybe this is a UK thing. Mm. Um, actually, and there's other, company, other countries are more formal than the UK. So like Germany, you have yes. certain language you have to use. Only when you get permission, can you change it to a more familiar thing? Yeah. Um, but like, when is it okay to add, add a client on Facebook? Yeah. Or I mean, and, and, and the thing to me is, if I look at who the CEOs that I interact with or, you know, the, the top folks in all of these businesses, there is no daylight between how they present themselves at work and Absolutely. how I see them afterwards. So yeah. it's, you, you can yeah. choose not to tell personal anecdotal stories, yeah, yeah. but yeah. your core character, how you present yourself, how you speak to people, I really don't think there should be much of a difference. Um, and I think that's what businesses are looking for. They want that sense of authenticity because it builds a sense of trust in that person, Definitely. that the person that you are is the person that you'll always be. 100%. And they want that. Uh, and so for me, that means, you know, I will talk about my husband when somebody asks me about my weekend, but I'll also be funny and quote Drake lyrics in meetings when I think it's appropriate. I yeah. don't think that impacts my competency. No, no, no. I think it just adds... So it gives you greater confidence than I'm being authentic. Yeah. So do you feel now that you're more effective than you've ever been, being completely open, authentic? Yeah. No, you really... It's amazing. Like, when I think about the different roles that I've taken, I think where I am right now, I feel most empowered and most uh, successful in the way that I do my work. And, it's, and there's a variety of reasons for that. You know, number one... I really studied hard to learn about insurance in any way, shape, or form that yeah. I could, yeah. you know, and talk to a lot of people about it. But it's also being comfortable and being confident in where I am and my trajectory and how I am perceived yes. um, and how I'm perceiving other people. Uh, I think one of the things we don't do enough of is asking people after things, how did that go? You know, how did that go for you? Like, what yeah. was that meeting like? Did you think I could have done something differently? You know, yeah. constantly get self improvement. Yeah, get that mindset. feedback loop. Yeah, um, and I also think it it opens up a great conversation with with coworkers, both peers and higher ups as well. I mean, yeah. if I do a presentation, I absolutely go to people after that presentation. Say, how did that go? And you can't tell me anything positive. Like, really force them to yeah, give you yeah. some constructive feedback. That's great. And most mm. people don't seek that out. No, it's, it's really important. It's so shocking to me. Like they're just yeah. waiting for somebody to give it to them. Like, Being no self-critical is so important. No one's gonna wait for it. You just go get it. Yeah, no, absolutely, it. absolutely. Crazy. Um, which people have had the biggest impact on you? Oh, and maybe a bunch of people. Um, this is a funny one because the first person that pops into my mind, um, and she is, she was just re-elected actually, um, is Senator Dianne Feinstein. Uh, oh, so right. um, she, so I'd worked, I'd worked in as a receptionist as a senator before her, and when he lost his reelection bid, um, I knew somebody in the 
somebody recommended her office to me and I became her scheduler and oh, then wow. I eventually became her executive assistant oh, for a number nice, of years. Nice. And um, she was she was such she is such a powerhouse and she set the mode for me about what a good boss is. Wow. So, you know, lessons about you know work as hard as you expect your staff and the people around you to work. Yeah, I mean, she yeah. Even even now, um, and she's been in the Senate for a while. She is absolutely rigorous. In, so long in hours. Long hours, but like not just long hours for the sake of it, but like yeah. applying the rigor necessary to get the facts in order yeah. to make a policy decision. Yeah. And what you see now is a lot of people <coughs> just go to a policy decision and they'll supplement it with facts. Right. And the thing yeah. I, I loved about Senator Feinstein was she absolutely went for the facts first. Get your facts first, and then go to the right. math. Right. And then the other thing is, she just runs a great ground game when it comes to organization and timekeeping, and also the importance of like personal appearance. Yeah. So, for me, and I was really young when I started working with her, having that sense of was structure, this while you were studying? No, this was just before. Right, so okay. um, this was just before I started studying law school. <coughs> Knowing the importance of like showing up to meetings on time, being 100%. present, yeah. having done the reading before you get into the room, have an understanding of what the agenda is, have an opinion on what's going to be discussed, um, was so important. And, uh, and so she, she just stands out in my mind when I think about how I engage with people, how I learn about things and think about things. A lot of that I, I got that, from her. I love that. Yeah. It's not taught in school. No. Turn up on time, always look smart. Yeah. Learn about what you're going to speak about. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's the ground game. Yeah. And I think when I speak to people who are frustrated in their career, or, you know, looking for something, I often do like the, well, let's talk about your ground game. Like, what do you, yeah. when are you showing up to work? What uh, hobbies do you have after work? What are you doing to improve your skill set? Yeah. Other than just going for coffees and waiting for a break. Absolutely. Don't Which be the is, person that keeps snoozing your remark. Yeah, that's Because you've lost before you've even got out of bed. Thing. And, you know, everyone thinks, you know, Everyone thinks that it's just a matter of luck, right? Like you just got to get in the right room with the right person and it'll happen. But luck favors the prepared. Absolutely. You need, yeah. you need to be skilling yourself up um, at all times. And, you know, that was something that she taught me very strongly. And it's something that has really served me well, yeah. especially, you know, coming over here and having to start at nothing. No, you know? There's no shortcut to success. There's no, you've there got is, to, there really you've got to put the work in and you get out what you put in. Yeah, you've really got to do it. You've yeah. got to do it. But I don't believe in luck. No, but it, and, and this is the thing, it's just like, the secret to success is to work hard at it. 100%. You know, there is, there's just, I've not it's seen just, anybody that's, no. you know, woke up one day and, you know, you can buy a ticket for the lottery, but what yeah. are the odds? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, you, great lessons. Yeah. Yeah, she was great. Yeah. She is great. Yeah. Did you see in touch? Um, so I did see her. Uh, I was back in, I was back in the U.S. just a couple of weeks ago. Um, as one of my side hobbies, I happen to be an ordained minister in the state of California. Wow. So I um, officiated you, the wedding of my put, younger brother. Did you? Yeah. No, um, so and so I, I caught up with her when I was in, in D.C. Um, and yeah, she's great. She's yeah. absolutely great. Yeah. yeah. And have you then implemented a lot? You've implemented a lot of that into your Completely. way of working. And Completely. So um, I think anybody, so I hope anybody that knows me knows that I really focus on being timely. You know, like I, yeah. I just I really value showing up to things on time because I think it's an immediate marker of how you perceive the other person, right? Like I yeah, actually, yeah. I, I fundamentally feel this way that I'm showing up into the meeting is not just about me being there, but it's also about you being there. And if I'm late, I think that has an implication of how I view you. Um, yeah. I, and I, I just feel really strongly about that. Yeah. So that's one of the things I've always, that she has absolutely instilled in me yeah. and that I, that I really, really carry forward still. Yeah. Do you find that most people turn up on time for your meetings? I think most is a strong word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and, it's and a big problem I think it's a big problem I think it's a big problem yeah I really really do and because we all have extreme pressures on our lives we you know we all have extremely hectic lives we're all juggling plates but that you've still got to get the core if there's a meeting in the diary right. for nine o'clock just tell us just a little bit up. before oh. and the thing and I've been absolutely shocked a few of these occasions like I you know people ask to meet with me to talk about their career and I don't I don't know why but I'm happy to do it and <laughs> And I had this one chap show up, and he was a solid 20 minutes late. What? And he wanted to talk about his CV, and I was like, <laughs> we're not even going to get to your CV. 
we're going to talk about your time management skills <laughs> and what it is about you that makes you think it's okay to waste 20 minutes of my time <laughs> and then come in and immediately start talking about you. Like, <laughs> wait, that's not going to happen. Unbelievable. <laughs> it was unbelievable. But it's not, it's not a rare occasion. No, no. No, no it's, it's really not. And um, I don't mind, this is the weird thing. If I'm meeting with somebody like a CEO or something like that, I don't mind waiting a few minutes because I understand. And I, and I almost think it's a courtesy for me to do that. It doesn't bother me. But anything beyond that, and I just sort of think, either you didn't want to be here, or, you know, it's... There's a genuine reason, perfect. like, a meeting was run over. Yeah. Fair enough. But I find, you know, the C-suite, well, I mean, it doesn't matter what, what job you're doing. Yeah. We're all the same. We're all humans. You just turn up on time. It's respectful. Mm. What a way to get a good meeting going. Turn up on time. It's, just it's, turn up it's on ground time. game. It's ground game. Yeah. So I've got some friends that are always late. So we, um, I tell them like, let's meet at half an hour earlier than we're actually going to meet. No, we have. And they just about make it on time. No, literally, we just started having this discussion in our house because we have some friends that are we put into the give them thirty minutes. <laughs> yes. so, yeah. so we just give them thirty minutes. You know, like if we need them at six thirty, we'll tell them six o'clock. And <laughs> they don't know this, and I'm not going to name names, but um, they could probably figure it out. <laughs> oh dear. it's uh it's uh it's a funny one it is a funny one yeah I, I don't and i don't know why some people have it and some people just absolutely do not have it i don't know if it's industry or i don't know upbringing no, it, it could be it's definitely like, not genetics it's not <laughs> genetics no my whole family i think i'm the only one that's that's me and my grandmother we're the ones that are like punctual is all get out um the rest of my family is sort of not particularly crazy punctual. oh dear yeah. Um, so we've talked, uh, we've talked about role models, being yep. authentic, yeah. visibility. Yeah. So you've now clearly made a ch uh, conscious decision to be visible, not just in your organization, but now more publicly. And yes. Do you think that's an important thing that people need to do to get on in their careers? And Completely. I mean, and, and this, is, this is one of those terms which I think have been co-opted successfully by diversity and inclusion mantras. And I think to the detriment of a lot of people think visibility only applies uh, uh, for people of the LGBT plus community. But I think this is one of the ones anyone in any career path, you need to be focusing on your level of visibility, not just to your higher ups and to jobs that you potentially are looking for, but also your peers. I mean, I see a lot of people failing because they just manage up so well. Yeah, yeah. And that will only get you so far because at some point your peers will play a role <laughs> in your career progression and if you haven't Absolutely. if you haven't been visible to them if you haven't uh, been present for them that they will make that mark but it's also you know and, and and how do you do that um and i think there's so many wonderful opportunities to get visibility i mean yeah. you and i talked about this we're both members of the worshipful company of insurers yes yeah which i think is an excellent way to get visible because most of those members, a lot of the members are uh, very senior Absolutely. in the insurance industry. And you know, just, just like that, you go have a lunch and you're sitting next to see yeah, it's yeah. important. I mean, obviously you have to have something to talk about once you get there, but, but half it's there. turning up. We yeah. talked about putting the work in, this is part of putting the work in. But you know, and then there's all, every company that I know of is running some sort of parallel strategy piece on how to improve something that's going on inside their company, whether it's a process or um, a new product or you know some sort of uh, exercise where they're, they're looking at what is possible and I think anybody who puts those hands up put their hands up for those you know that type of work to volunteer on those types of committees or to write a paper or do a presentation or something it pays such dividends yeah, yeah. Um, because it's above and beyond what you're being expected to do but it's also you learning something yes yeah. and it's giving you the visibility it's like it's literally the triple threat yeah um, so I, you know you you people, I, I cannot stress it enough. You've got to be visible. If you, no one's going to hire you if no one knows who you are. Yeah, yeah. But then equally, there's the other point of it, which is you being visible. You don't know who's watching you. Do that, right? And like that was the that's true. That was part of the point on the whole Financial Times list as well. Was that I am aware that there are people at Lloyd's who don't feel comfortable being out. And yeah, so yeah. if I can be as visible as I possibly can be that impacts them and hopefully then they'll become visible and it sort of begins this well, yeah this thing about you being a role model yeah. and it's in it but it's you know for me it's a role model on for the lgbt community but it could be for anything you could be role modeling any behavior absolutely and if you're being visible when you're doing it you're impacting people yeah uh, who are around you your yeah. peers or, or others yeah. so it's just you, you've got a specific goal here mm -hmm. 
being visible just generally is um, it can be quite daunting for people. You know, it's like attending networking events. No one likes to go and attend no. a networking event, or, s or it's quite hard for people to speak to people they don't know. I um, get that. You know, standing up on stage yeah. is not for everyone. No, and so the networking thing. Uh, in full disclosure, uh, I really still get very nervous going to network events, and people are always surprised when I say because they, they think I'm not. But no, I really, I really am, and especially approaching somebody you don't know. Yeah. And especially when I first started in this sector, and I didn't. Not only did I not know anything, but I also didn't know anybody. Yeah. So I would practice one hook that if I was to cold meet somebody, what would my one hook be? Yeah. And usually I tried to I tried to read something sure, one interesting. Chat up line. It's the one <laughs> chat up line, like the one thing that, you know, so I remember when we were at one time, electronic placement was really coming into the fore of the discussion. And I remember for a few months, I just had you know, a couple articles that I had read about electronic placement so that if I ever cold met somebody, you know, it would be like, oh, you know, so what are your thoughts on electronic placement? You know, is it the future? You know, it just, yeah. and if you practice it and you go into the room with it, it makes it less daunting yeah. because then the only thing is you just have to find somebody to give it to. Because right? everyone, everyone feels the same. Yeah. Everyone's and got a little no bit of one, nervousness for no someone it. they don't know. No one loves it. Yeah. But, um, and actually I found that to be really effective. That's you didn't advice. need a whole lot. And then, you know, you'd have a chat with somebody and either it would go somewhere or it wouldn't go somewhere. And yeah. that's fine. But yeah. you still had uh, your one piece. So, I, you know, I tell that to anybody who's feeling nervous about networking. Number one, we are all feeling it. But number yeah. two, just have one thing to talk about. Yeah. You just need one, one. nice question, yeah. open ended. Yeah. With AI and all this stuff, I think it's going to be even more important for networking, the continued learning, being visible. Yeah. Both on, also online as well. Yeah. So we talked offline. Online writing stuff, yes, a podcast, whatever it might be, um, you got to upskill it. Yeah, because it changed the game. Essentially, if it is something that can be commoditized, in the sense, that is it yeah. something that can be put down to a spreadsheet in numbers? Then it eventually will be. Yeah. And so, if you're not moving, in in a way to make sure that whatever you're doing is not something that can be replicated easily, yeah. um, then you're putting yourself at risk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's whether that's AI or you know any other force that's going to come into the market. Absolutely. Yeah. So a lot of stuff coming down the road. Completely, and it's exciting. People should yeah, be excited. Yeah, super they should, excited. You know, it's it's yeah. it can be scary because you know you've been doing you've been doing something for so long and all of a sudden it risks. It's only scary if you have it. no idea what. To, and this is this can be any age. I mean, I don't think, I'm, I'm fairly sure the jobs my daughters are going to do haven't been invented yet. Completely. I completely agree. With and even even the digital marketeer is only like ten years old, maybe. Yeah. No, I, and I agree. Um, I challenge. I don't know. I absolutely agree with that. I don't know if the skill sets necessary to do these jobs are going to change that much. No, I agree. So I think, I think I agree. you can focus yeah. on building yeah. your skill set. You know, your core competencies, um, and then the actual technical information is something that you can learn and gather, and you should be doing as you as you go through. But yeah, oh, yeah. hundred percent agree. In ten yeah. years. There's going to be, I mean, look at the jobs we're doing now. They didn't exist 10 years ago. You well, know, there's, no, there's all changed. whole industries yeah. that are brand new. I mean, even, even like, okay, so my job as a headhunter, mm. I mean, that's been going around for a while. But technology has is, is changed and improved the way we work. That whole industry is changing. I mean, you're also a very proficient podcast host. And that well, certainly didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> and no, if I wanted to do a podcast like this, um, we'd have had to have, like, hired a big studio. Completely. Um, had like all the setup. Yeah. And now, so see, so, I mean now, so now even in this time, the written word, the, the spoken and spoken word and video mm. is teaching people more than the written word, which has only really been recent. So think how many more people in the world, people who can't read, yeah. can learn more just by listening. Yeah. It's amazing. That is, it is. And with these kind of longish format uh, podcasts, you can really get into topics in quite detail. Yeah. And then someone listens to it. And they get on bored the on their way to work. And Happens all the time. Yeah. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for yeah, it was a joining real pleasure. me. We should do them more regularly. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Lewis. Cool. Cheers. Hey, folks, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe in all the usual places. <laughs>